worship at New Scotland Presbyterian Church. I'm the Reverend Holly Cameron and so glad to have you worshiping with us today. The roses on the pulpit today are in honor of two births in our church family. Uh, one is for Parker John, who is the great grandson of Anne. His grandparents are Don and Jack and parents are Jessica and Eric. And the other rose is for Joel Jonathan, who is the great grandson of Evelyn. His grandparents are Debbie and Bob and parents are Christina and Jonathan. So congratulations to both of those families on these uh, wonderful, joyful births and new babies. So now let us worship God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Let us worship God together. the light of hearts that feel you, the life of souls that love you, the strength of thoughts that seek you. When we turn from you, we falter. When we turn toward you, we rise. And when we abide in you, we stand secure forever. You call us to live as one and to honor each other's gifts. Yet we divide ourselves into categories, separating one from another. You call us to freedom and rest, but we toil at endless tasks and impose labor on others. You call us to love and serve you, but we serve the gods of profit and production, believing they give us worth. In reality, our ceaseless striving smothers our souls and swallows us alive. You have taught us that all our deeds without love are worth nothing. 
As we gather for worship this day, pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, the very bond of peace and all goodness. Redeem us, transform us, and renew us, that we may discern your will for what is good and pleasing for all. Take away the power of sin and allow us to find our joy in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the promise of Scripture is that love and mercy surround us always. Our Creator cherishes us, and God loves us, heals us, and gives us the grace we need for new beginnings. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Gospel lesson today comes from the book of Matthew. Let us listen for the Word of God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here ends the reading. May God add blessings to our understanding. Now we have time for our kids, so I hope the kids can be present for this part of the video, and I will come out of the pulpit as I do each week for our kids' time. Hi kids, I'm so glad I can talk to you through this video while we're apart. We just heard a Bible story where Jesus was talking with his disciples and he asked them, what are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? And they said, some people think you are a preacher like John the Baptist. And some think you are a miracle worker like Elijah. And some think you are a prophet like Jeremiah. And Jesus said, well, what do you think? And Simon said, I think you are the Messiah. You are God's son. And Jesus said, you are right. And Jesus was so pleased that he decided to give Simon a nickname. Now, I wonder if any of you have a nickname. Usually our friends or family give us a nickname that says something about us, about who we are. Like, I bet people in your family might have called you sweetie, which means they think you're being very sweet and very kind and very nice. Well, Jesus said that he thought Simon was very strong, and so he said, I think you are like a rock to build a church on, so I'm going to call you Rocky. Now, that's not exactly what you heard me read when I read the story from the Bible. That's because the Bible was written in a different language from ours. So in the Bible language, it says, I am going to call you Petros, which means Peter. And on this Petra, which means rock, I will build my church. So he says, I'm going to call you Petros. And on this Petra, I will build my church. In English, we would say, I'm going to call you Rocky. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, rocks are very strong and sturdy. Lots of buildings get built on rocks. And if you've ever noticed at our church, you can see some places, the rocks at the bottom that hold the church up. So Jesus knew that Peter would be very strong 
and he would help a lot of people learn about God's love and learn about Jesus. And so that's why he wanted to call him Rocky. I wonder what nickname Jesus would have for you or for me. What would Jesus see in us that he would say, this is who you are? That's something good for us to think about. So I hope you'll think about this week. What would Jesus give you for a nickname? Now we're going to see the photos that people have been sending in. So let's take a few moments and watch those. some great pictures. Thanks everyone for sending them in. I hope you'll keep sending us in some pictures so that we can see your faces and see what you're doing this summer. Pictures that remind us about God's love and hope being always around us. And this week, I wonder if you have any pictures of rocks, if you see some rocks that you can help and uh, show us. I know some people collect rocks that are in the shape of hearts. I've had rocks in the shape of hearts, and I've had rocks that have all kinds of beautiful colors. So if you see any good looking rocks, I hope you'll send us pictures of those this week too. So let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to teach about your love. Thank you for his disciples that started all the churches. Help us to see others as you see them and help us to share your love with everyone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Exodus. Let us continue to listen for God's word to us. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. 
Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in impossible tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiprah and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Here ends the reading. May God bless us with understanding. Our perception of the world affects everything we do. It affects how we make our choices and how we react to what is happening around us. So it matters whether we think the world is a warm, wonderful place, brimming with excitement and adventure, or whether we think it's a scary place, filled with danger and terrible situations lurking around every corner or whether we think it's a sad place filled with loneliness and pain and suffering. Sometimes we get so locked into our vision of the world, we feel there is only one way to react, one choice to make, only one acceptable way to be. But when we can see the world from different perspectives, we discover there are always other choices and other ways. In today's Old Testament lesson, we see people making a whole variety of choices based on their different views of the world. Now we remember the last stories in the book of Genesis 
were about the life of Joseph. And we heard some of his story in the last couple weeks, how he was favored by his father, but so hated by his brothers that they threw him in a pit where he was captured by bandits and taken as a slave to the land of Egypt. How he ended up in prison, but then became part of the royal family because he was able to interpret dreams. And how he eventually reconciled with his own family and brought them to Egypt, where they all settled. So today we begin the next book of Exodus, and we learn that the king of Egypt has died, and Joseph has died, and many generations have passed so that the Israelites, first established by Joseph's family, have become numerous in Egypt, so numerous that the now ruling Pharaoh has decided to enslave them. The new Pharaoh's view of the world was clearly one filled with political backstabbing and threats, so he was suspicious and decided to squash anything that looked like a threat to his power. He ordered the Hebrew people into forced labor, but after some years, he found that they were still flourishing. Their slavery had not decreased their numbers, and their spirits had not been broken. So Pharaoh issued a new directive for the midwives that they should kill all the Hebrew boys as they were being born. His view of the world seems to be getting darker, so much so that even newborn babies are now seen as a threat to his position and power. But the midwives had a different view of the world, one where new life is seen as a precious gift not as potential enemies. So they made choices in defiance of Pharaoh's orders. Shipra and Pua chose not to kill the babies they helped deliver. Their view of the world must have been more optimistic than Pharaoh's, but still, they were not naive. They understood Pharaoh's power so when they were called before him, they lied and told him, well, of course they wanted to follow his directive, but they were not able to kill the newborns because the babies came before they could get there. Pharaoh's view seems to become even more paranoid. So now he issues this order to the entire nation that all the Hebrew boys should be killed. Forget trying to do this in a quiet manner with some memos to the midwives. Now he makes a public decree for the whole land that the lives of the Hebrew babies were a blight and needed to be removed however they could by whatever means possible. And the people apparently went along with Pharaoh's suspicious view because we have every indication that his decree was in fact carried out. So now we have an idea about Pharaoh's worldview and the midwives' worldview and the public at large when we get introduced to yet another worldview. A story of a Levite man and woman who marry and have a baby boy and successfully hide him for three months their view must be one of hope and trust that miracles can happen because the baby's mother set him in a basket on the river and believed his life would somehow be spared. The baby was discovered by Pharaoh's own daughter, whose view of the world is not so clear, but she must not have seen the Hebrews as the threat her father did because she recognized that the baby was a Hebrew boy, but she ignored her father's declaration and she chose to keep the baby and raise him as her own. See, our perceptions of the world affect the choices that we make. And when we've established our view of the world, 
we start to limit our choices. We get fooled into thinking that our vision is the only vision, that our perception of the world is reality. But it is not. Because there is a vision and a reality beyond anything humans can comprehend. God created the world. God has a vision of the world, a view of reality that we can never fully grasp. And that vision, God's reality, God's will, can never be completely covered up by our plans or our visions or our understandings. A few weeks ago, we had the parables about the kingdom of heaven, where we hear that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed or like yeast in a loaf of bread. They seem to be about big things coming from small beginnings. But I wonder if they are also about how some things accomplish their purpose in a way that is hidden from human eyes. How a mustard seed goes about growing into a bush underneath the soil where we cannot see it taking its root. Or how yeast causes a loaf to rise even though we do not see it at work. I wonder if God's vision is like that, working itself out all around us and yet hidden from our view. When Pharaoh looks out, he sees a world of threat, so he issues his command to kill all the baby boys. When the decree is in effect, I'm sure the Hebrew people look at the world and see a land of horror and evil as their offspring are being ruthlessly slaughtered. And the people who allow it, who do not stand up and protest, maybe see the world as a brutal place where injustice happens, but what can you do? You just have to learn to live with it. Or maybe they see the world as a place where only a few have power, and the rest of us need to just hunker down and protect ourselves so that we do not become the next target. Each of these worldviews is valid and real, but real as they are, they are not the whole of reality. For God's vision is also a reality in this world. It may feel hidden at any given moment, but still the kingdom of heaven is here and is at work in the world. In this story, God's plan was working its way through all the realities of the Egyptians and the Hebrew slaves, unstopped by Pharaoh or his henchmen. A savior for the Israelites was born and kept from the slaughter for three months. And when the baby was rescued, God's vision worked its way into Pharaoh's own household through the vision of his daughter, who chose a different version of reality from her nation and from her own father. The challenge of our faith is to determine which voices we are listening to, which ones are shaping our view of the world. Our certainties about the world can change in an instant. One change in leadership, one doctor's visit, one phone call can turn our world upside down and change everything we thought we knew about the world. There is much in this world that we cannot control And there is much in this world that we may never experience firsthand. And that is why it is so valuable to hear the perspectives of other people. 
I've been interested how in recent years we have seen the retelling of famous stories to try to see a different perspective. For example, many of us grew up with the story of the Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is the hero and we learn the story from her perspective. But in the popular musical Wicked, the same story gets told from the perspective of the witches, which makes the story look quite different. Many modern novels also use this device, telling some chapters from the viewpoint of one character and other chapters by a different character so that we as the reader get to see there are multiple experiences of the same reality. Some of us are reading a book right now called Waking Up White, written by a woman in a prominent New England family, how she grew up seeing the world and her reality of life in one way, and then began to learn the perspectives of people who grew up very different from her and shifting her perspective of the world and reality. The stories of scripture give us the opportunity to see a story from many different perspectives. If we go through all the characters in this story, we can land on a whole bunch of different understandings, a whole bunch of different viewpoints. So the Pharaoh decides the world is out of control and it must be the fault of the slaves. If they could be eliminate, eliminated, he seems to think, then all would be well. So I wonder if there are times when we have blamed someone else for our unhappiness, believing if they would just shape up or change, then we would finally be happy. The Pharaoh also felt threatened by people that were different from him. And I wonder if we have ever been in a situation where we faced that feeling, where we believed if someone else got what we wanted, then somehow we would be harmed if a colleague got the promotion, or a friend won that love interest, or another buyer got that house, then somehow we would be harmed or we would have been cheated. The midwives and Pharaoh's daughter act against the orders of the king. When is it acceptable, if not mandatory, for individuals and congregations to disobey the rules at hand? What are the higher values that transcend human rules and laws that come and go and change through time? The midwives and Moses' parents are not part of the ruling class of their time, but they somehow understand the will of God. In what ways do we hear God speaking from the margins of society? And what messages might we hear? Miriam watches over her baby brother, making sure he is cared for. In what ways are we watchful and compassionate over those in need? And Moses' mother fashions a basket to keep him safe and dry to hide him amongst the reeds of the river. How do we watch over our children to keep them safe from the violence in the world? So many perspectives in just one story. I visited the Alamo a couple years ago and I remember a placard there that said something like, history is not just one story to be passed down through the generations. There are always many stories happening simultaneously 
and hearing stories from many perspectives helps us to shift our view of the world. It's not always easy, and it's not always comfortable. That's the thing about coming to stand and see something from another perspective. It can move us to a place where we are not so sure anymore about things that maybe we've been very sure of. But growth comes through pushing our sometimes too comfortable boundaries. And our faith is not about keeping us comfortable. As people of faith, we believe the world belongs to God, and God's view challenges all the voices and views of this world. We are called as people of faith to listen to the many stories of God's people, knowing that God's vision of reality is bigger than any of our visions of reality. And as people of faith, we believe no matter what circumstances we are currently living in, God is still at work calling faithful people to listen, to learn, to resist when necessary, and to keep caring for the most vulnerable. God's vision is working all around us. Let us pray that it will also work through us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, we give you thanks today for your many gifts at work in our community. We do not all have the same view, but you have provided many talents that we might serve and receive from one another. Thank you for those who use their gifts for the benefit of others. Thank you for encouragers, for generous givers, for diligent leaders, for compassionate listeners, for essential workers. Thank you for those able and willing to bake and cook, build and paint, sing and teach, mow and weed, for those who send cards and those who make phone calls. Thank you for elders and children and all ages in between. And thank you for the Spirit of Christ who calls us to live and work together in harmony. God of salvation, bring freedom to those who are oppressed and enslaved in our world. As you brought forth Moses to lead your people out of slavery and to the promised land, call out leaders to help wherever people are denied their freedom. God of grace and mercy, hear our prayers for those in need. We long for your peace and we pray for all in harm's way. We pray for the hungry and homeless, for the sick and the dying, for the confused and hopeless, for those in prison and those imprisoned by addiction. We pray for those who are victims of circumstances that are out of their control, for victims of violence and domestic violence, for those whose lives have been upended by storms and wildfires. Help us, O oh God, to reach out in compassion and caring so that your love may be offered to those who are unmoored from their security. And guide us to follow more and more in the way of Jesus. Hear us as we say the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, Scripture teaches us not to be independent, but to be interdependent. These times have reminded us that none of us can live all on our own. We are partners in making sure we get through this difficulty and to the other side. We are strengthened in our support of one another. We share our gifts so that all get what they need. So let us combine our offerings to do Christ's mission in the world. Churches depend on the generosity of members and friends. So thank you for your generous giving. As we conclude our worship, hear again these words from St. Paul. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Go into this week trusting that God's transforming power is at work in your lives. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope both this day and always. Amen. Thank you. 